Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday uh, evening as it, well, at least for the moment, the, the skies have parted and, and, and given us a little sunshine before the rain tonight. Um, but we're so glad that you could join us for another patient webinar. Um, my name is Michael York, and I will be your moderator for this evening. Um, throughout tonight's uh, presentation, if you do have any questions, um, please go ahead and submit them to either the chat or the question and answer function down below. Um, the hand raising uh, tends to be a little bit difficult, so please use the chat uh, and or the question and answer function that uh, is the best way to go about doing getting in your questions for tonight's presentation. Um, tonight's webinar will be on age-related macular degeneration in 2023, as you can see there, and it is presented by our very own Dr. Brian Kim. Um, Dr. Kim does our medical retina and cataract specialist here at Harvard Eye Associates, and we're, we're obviously, he has got a lot, of, a lot of knowledge on tonight's topic and where we are very fortunate to have him. Um, just a little bit of background about Dr. Kim, just before we dive into tonight's presentation. Uh, Dr. Kim did re first receive his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Columbia University, um, after which he earned his medical degree from Penn State University. Um, he then uh, began and completed his internal medicine internship at St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix. Uh, after, afterwards, he conducted his ophthalmology residency at the Gavin Harbor Eye Institute at UCI. Um, and then going from one highly regarded program to another, Dr. Kim moved uh, across the country and completed his fellowship in medical retina and, uh, at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute uh, in Florida. And he finds himself back here in California and, uh, in Laguna Hills with Harvard Eye Associates. And we couldn't be more happy to have him with us as a practice and with us tonight. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass things off to Dr. Brian Kim. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, it's um, I've never been referred to as when the when the clouds part as rays of sunshine. That's that's a new one for me. But thank you, I appreciate that. Um, thank you, everybody, for spending your Tuesday evening with me uh, and and all of us here at Harvard. I uh, just learning about macular degeneration. Um, I'll try to keep this as succinct as possible. But as you all know, I think uh, most of most of you really want to know the details. So, I'll, but I'll try to keep it as succinct and. Uh, uh, as possible. And uh, yeah, like Michael said, please feel free to chime in with questions that you may have um, throughout. I'll try and get to as many as possible. Um, but um, but thank you again for joining us. Um, this tends to be one of our more popular ones. I've been doing this for oh, about, almost uh, about eight years now at running. Uh, February is Macular Degeneration Awareness Month. This year happens actually to be one of the more exciting ones, uh, not because of my just phenomenal presenting skills, but also because of some new breakthrough things that have come through uh, for the treatment of macular degeneration. So, and this was as recent as just a few days ago. So I will, um, well, we'll get to that in just a minute, but let's bring everybody up to speed. Um, this is a lecture that we're gonna talk about uh, who gets macular degeneration uh, or age-related macular degeneration. We abbreviate that, abbreviate that as AMD. Uh, some people will see it as ARMD, but, um, uh, that's e equally an, an acceptable abbreviation. Uh, we're going to talk about what is macular degeneration, what the treatments of macular degeneration, and what the future holds uh, for this condition. Uh, you'll note that the slides are going to be fairly plain because um, this is actually geared with the uh, color set in mind for people who have macular degeneration to be following along with us. So, uh, so I apologize if they um, if the slides look fairly plain, but there is a reason for that. Um, and I and I think uh, and I hope those of you who are um, who do have uh, macular degeneration are uh, are able to follow along a little bit easier. So um, so let's start with the with uh, the leading causes of blindness in the world. The World Health Organization back in 2020 has identified five main reasons for blindness or uh, vision loss in in humans, and number one being cataract. Unfortunately, as most of you probably know. We have surgery for cataracts, uh, and I think worldwide, it just tends to be more of an access of care problem than anything else. We're just some people in, in uh, non-industrialized countries are just not able to get cataract surgery that they need, and that's why it's up there. But you'll see, number two is macular degeneration. For the United States of America, that's number one actually for age 65 and older. Macular degeneration is the number one leading cause of blindness or vision loss, I should say. Um, Glaucoma is a close number three. Uh, diabetes is four. Uh, diabetes tends to be the leading cause of blindness in the United States. 
uh, for ages, uh, for, for younger, for more middle age. Um, and then number five is corneal opacities, uh, which again is an access to care problem worldwide. In 2019, we'll see that 19.8 million Americans 40 and older have macular degeneration which uh, they wrote 12.6% of the population. I think I calculated that a little bit differently. I think it's more like 6% or 5% 5, 5 of the population based on the 330 million uh, people in the United States. Um, so I, I'm not quite certain where they got that statistic, but I'll, this is straight from the horse's mouth. I will quote what they, what they wrote, 12.6% uh, of the population. Um, of these, 1.5 million of the 19.8 million have vision threatening macular degeneration. Um, so as you can see, most people are actually, they might have some a uh, little bit of vision uh, difficulties, but are really not at the point where they have lost significant amount of vision. So that's the important take home point here. And, and, and I'll show you that further along in, in the slideshow, but um, you can see that part of the definition or part of the uh, description of macular degeneration is that it's AMD, age-related macular degeneration. So that means that the prevalence of it, and we're going to see more of it, the older we get. So of Americans aged 40 to 44 years old, about 2% of the population have AMD or signs of macular degeneration. But once we get up to 85 years old and older, it's almost 40, almost 50%, so about 45% of the population actually shows signs of AMD. So, uh, so you can see how this risk rises very, very quickly with age. Um, this is a slide that I know it's kind of busy with graphs, um, and I apologize. I don't like to show a whole lot of math for, for people out there, but, um, but basically the left half shows the breakdown. It's almost 50-50 male and female, um, as, by, as denoted by these top bars here. Uh, macular generation doesn't have too much of a genetic, uh, a gender predilection, although it's interesting that this is the numbers. It usually has a female preponderance just slightly. Um, but I do want to point your attention over to this right side of the graph that's, that's squared off. You'll notice it's, dis it's divided up by race. And so black or non-Hispanic in the United States, this is black or non-Hispanic, Hispanic population, white or Caucasian, non-Hispanic, and then others like Asians and, and um, Pacific Islanders um, fall into this category. But you'll see that Caucasians tend to have the highest predilection for it, uh, and we'll see that the most. It's starting to even out, I think, mostly because of uh, just the diversity of the, of the United States. But, um, but historically, it's been an overwhelming preponderance that Caucasians are more affected uh, than any other ethnicity. And the reason for that is this goes back to the Black Plague um, in the 1300s. Um, the people who survived the Black Plague actually have a slightly altered immune system, and we can tra trace that back genetically um, to this time frame. And the people who have a slightly altered immune system let them live and fought off the Black Plague better. So that's the reason that you're all here. Um, but what it does is it gives you a little bit of an earlier onset macular degeneration in life. So we don't really understand why that is, but we do know it's related. It's not like um, rheumatism or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, as some people, uh, as what we commonly know it, but it's not an autoimmune kind of problem where we can give steroids. It's a, it's a, it is part of the immune system, but it's a different part of the immune system. So we're trying to combat that through, um, by altering the, what's called the complement cascade. Um, and that's a, that's a point I'll make later on in the lecture also, but um, but yeah, it goes back to the Black Plague, and thankfully, they survived, but that's the reason that we have macular degeneration in mostly European descendants. So, so macular degeneration, um, and why I would expect most of you people are here is because uh, you want to know, when am I going blind? Um, it's the scariest part of it, and a lot of times people associate macular degeneration with blindness, and I want to dive right in and, and dispel that myth right off the bat. Um, macular degeneration is not a totally blinding condition. I'll repeat that. Macular degeneration is not a totally blinding condition. It can be vision impairing. It can cause legal blindness. But what it does is it affects the center of our vision only. So in a moderate stage, moderate to early, early severe stage, you might see something like this. This, is, of course, is a simulation 
where the middle of the vision is starts to get a little bit distorted, maybe even a little bit grayed out. Um, and we might start to miss pieces of, of the picture. But the peripheral vision is all intact. And this picture is not very representative because remember your vision is your peripheral vision. It's much larger than this picture. So um, it's only really that center area. And in fact, it looks something more like this. Um, and when you're looking at somebody at about arm's length, the worst case scenario is it affects the center part of the vision only. So you wouldn't be, the, you wouldn't be able to see facial features well, but you will be able to see pretty much everything else using your peripheral vision. So fortunately, as you remember by those numbers, that doesn't happen all that often. Um, that's only in, in a small minority of people with macular degeneration. So, but even if you do go onto this stage, you're still highly functional. These people are, um, uh, are still able to take care of themselves um, and be become fairly independent. Reading things are is a little challenging, seeing faces and, and watching TV may be a little bit difficult, but they'll be able to, to, to take care of themselves um, on the whole. Um, so now let's start at the beginning. Let's bring everybody up to speed. And when we start talking about eyes and vision, the first thing we wanna talk about is this left picture, the white picture here and what normal vision is. So we're looking at the eye in cross section, a side view of the eye. And light comes in through the front of the eye from the right side over here. Light enters through the front of the eye, through the cornea, through the pupil here. And it's focused on the back inside wall of the eye, like the film in a camera, if you will. And the center of the film is called the macula here. So now if we turn and look at it head on, and we look straight into someone's eye. This picture on the right is this orange moon, it looks like, is, is what the macula actually looks like. We see the optic nerve here, and this connects our eye straight back to the brain. You can, of course, see all the blood vessels. And then this darker area right here is the macula itself, this whole area right here. And macular degeneration affects this area and this area only. So now macular degeneration is divided into two types and we commonly hear the dry form or the wet form. And it kind of helps to think of it as dry is the more common one. Dry is sort of, um, it's, it's sort of like a desert. It, it kind of, it leads to um, slow atrophy, slow weakening of vision. Wet is more like what it kind of implies is a sort of a leak and it can cause bleeding or fluid buildup inside the retina or under the retina. And that can cause to a much more rapid decline of vision. The way I like to uh, explain it, oops, sorry, is, is um, go back in just a second, is, uh, is with the car analogy or tires on a car in particular. Dry macular degeneration like tires on a car, the longer you go in life, the tires start to wear down and will lead to bald spots on the tires. And it can be pretty difficult to drive on in time. Wet macular degeneration is more like running out of gas. So if you have a leak, you really stop the car, the car cannot drive uh, right away. So vision loss is, tends to be much more sudden, much more rapid onset. So now people start with, uh, with early stage dry macular degeneration. Um, and then they slowly progress through the stages, through an early phase to an intermediate stage and to a more advanced stage. And at any point along the way, people can suddenly switch branches and start to leak or start to bleed into the retina. And that's, what, that's when we, we make this branch into wet macular degeneration. So that can occur at any stage. It can happen at early or intermediate stage or even at the advanced stage. So, um, so both stages require monitoring. So here's the kind of what the, uh, the evolution is, and this is from more of a medical standpoint so we can understand. A lot of times when we go in and see the eye doctors, uh, you'll get a, a photograph, a retinal photograph. They'll offer you that screening photo. And this is, what it, this is the value of it. Oftentimes we'll pick up early stages of macular degeneration. And so when we take the photograph, remember this is, I'll keep the normal picture here on the left and I'll just change the right one here. So again, we see our optic nerve here and our blood vessels, and this central area here is the macula. But if we look very carefully, and this is kind of hard to see, we have all these little yellow dots, and sometimes people, sometimes your doctor will call those little yellow spots or deposits, 
or drusen is what they're actually called. Those are an indication of aging or slowing of the metabolism. Um, those start to build up. And one or two I generally feel are okay. Um, and it's kind of like having trash bags in a house. We kind of expect metabolism to slow down and build up a couple little trash bags. Um, but if you start to have too much trash in the house, it starts to become a toxic environment. And we're starting to build up um, uh, trash bags here. You can see the drusen are getting larger. Uh, and this is sort of an early stage of macular degeneration. Um, and this is more of an intermediate stage, which it's starting to affect vision. We can start, it's starting to cause a little bit of blurriness, contrast problems. You might see splotches uh, in the vision or ink spots in the vision to, uh, on occasion. And then it moves on to the more advanced stage. And the advanced stage, and this is kind of hard to see, but the advanced stage means that we've actually lost areas. These are the bald spots, so to speak. So this is all atrophy. And those are all areas where there is no vision. So it's kind of like Swiss cheese vision in this one particular patient. So, so we prefer not to, if we can, try to slow it down. We prefer not to get to advanced stage macular degeneration if we can avoid it. And of course, if we get to the very, very end stage, that bald spot can take up the entire section of the macula, the entire macula itself. And this would be more of that picture that we saw of the girl. It would affect the center vision, um, and you probably wouldn't be able to see the faces of people um, at arm's length. Now, the reason that staging it is difficult, and the reason that oftentimes doctors are a little bit hesitant to say what stage macular degeneration you have is because it doesn't really matter. Um, if you have an advanced stage, like this person has a huge area, a huge bald spot, that's this entire gray area. We can see it better on this black and white scan. This huge, this C is an area of atrophy, but yet they see very well. They see only a couple few letters off of 2020. So even though this person has advanced stage macular degeneration, they're seeing fine and they can drive a car and they can read and they can see faces. And, and so if, um, you know, this is, this is the problem. Um, we can't really say, we can't correlate stage of macular degeneration to level of vision. Um, likewise, conversely, you can actually have an intermediate or a moderate stage of macular degeneration and have worse vision than what this patient has. So, um, so it's a little bit tricky in, as to how we classify it, but also how we can convey it in a realistic and practical, meaningful manner to, to patients. So, um, so it's, it's a little bit tricky. Um, so, but what we do is we, we want to try and gather information. So everybody's different, and we try to figure out exactly what the rapidity, how the speed of progression for macular degeneration and that's a really hard thing to do um, because everybody wants to know. That's the one question everybody wants to know. How much time do I have left? And that's the one answer we don't have a crystal ball for. And we don't even have a, a clue. We have no statistics on it because it's so very different. Some people can go from, from a moderate stage to losing vision in 6 to 12 months. Other people can be at a moderate stage for decades. Um, other people can have an advanced stage for five years and still be 2020. So it's, it really is a very, ch it's very challenging to be able to prognosticate, to predict the future and try and figure out how much vision you can keep. Um, so, but what we try and do is we try to classify it and we try to see um, what kind of risk we have. And so one of the common imaging um, tests that you'll have done is something called an OCT. And those are the photos that we see on the right, or not photos, these are scans of your retina. And what we do is we take a, we're looking into the eye, we take a horizontal section like this, a slice like this, and then the camera turns the retina sideways. So we're looking at the height of the retina here. And this is a normal OCT. This is what a normal, normal macula looks like. And this is somebody who has dry macular degeneration. It has all these little lumpy bumpies. And those are all those yellow deposits. These are all the drusen that are building up underneath the retina, between the retina and the wall of the eye is what I call it. And so these are your little trash bags. So we, we don't like too many of them in there. So um, now over time, uh, some people, if you're unfortunate enough, 
it will start to leak or bleed. And that's what wet macular degeneration is. You can see how the, some of these bumps don't look like drusen. These are bleeds. These are starting to grow blood vessels. It's starting to push up the retina. We're starting to see blood here on the inside the eye in the retina itself. And it's starting to cause fluid. That's what this black area is. It's starting to push fluid underneath your retina and leak fluid in there. And so that is something that's more concerning. When, if we don't treat wet macular degeneration, that bleed and that, that hemorrhage starts to grow. And then it starts to scar, kind of like um, having a cut on your skin. If you were to cut yourself and you have a, a microscopic damage to your retina is, is kind of similar to that. But if you cut your skin, you'll bleed and you'll scar. And structurally, that will be come, come back to just about full strength. It will become structurally very strong with that scar again. It will heal. And that's what the eye, we think, that's what the eye is trying to do. We think that there's microscopic damage to the retina. And the body is trying to repair it. So it starts to bleed and scar. And structurally, the retina will go back to being very structurally strong again. The problem is, is that we don't see well through scar, so you lose functionality. And so we try to limit that with our treatments, okay? And I'll talk about treatments um, pretty soon. So um, now, if we have macular degeneration in the family and, and we say, uh oh, I'm, I'm worried. Yes, it's genetically linked. There is a genetic risk factor that is passed on or can be passed on. Um, and so we currently, we um, a lot of people ask for screening appointments. Um, you don't really hear about screening too often, and there's a reason for that, uh, because there are no screening guidelines recommended for macular degeneration. Um, and, um, and so because pretty much everybody after age 50, it's just generally recommended that we have annual eye exams anyway, uh, and that's to catch things like cataract and glaucoma and, um, and, uh, and other kinds of ocular diseases that may not have any symptoms at all. So as long as you're seeing an eye doctor annually, um, things like the screening retinal photographs, or if they dilate your eyes, those are highly encouraged because we can catch macular degeneration at the earliest stage. Uh, people often ask about genetic testing. That's currently not recommended by, um, by multiple um, ophthalmological societies and retinal specialist societies because it doesn't really change anything. It doesn't change how often we watch it. It doesn't change anything. Um, it just adds a level of uh, insecurity and, uh, and a little bit of a, and a lot of anxiety to to some people. So we don't really recommend genetic testing at this time. It really doesn't affect how we how we monitor or treat people. So so let's move on to treatments. And um, this is the section that most people are interested in. To understand treatments, we first want to talk about the risk factors of macular degeneration, and we kind of break them down into what we call non modifiable, which is family you can't change your parents. Uh, you can't change your age. You can't change your farsightedness or your color of your iris. You can't change your, your genetic gender. You can't change your ethnicity. But things you can change, um, things like smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol, control your fats and processed foods. You can control your activity and exercise level, weight and heart disease. We can all, we can all modify that to some, if not um, a complete degree. So um, this is important uh, because you'll notice that all these risk factors are one and the same with aging. So um, if we um, slow down, if we, if we treat all those things and try to slow down the aging risk factors, we can oftentimes slow down macular degeneration. So the general recommendations, no smoking, exercise, control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol, uh, nothing you haven't heard already a thousand times from all your other doctors. Uh, and then we want to to uh, test your vision. And we say, I, I, I guess I wrote daily. I, I don't usually recommend daily. I usually say a few times a week, uh, like three, uh, two, three times a week. We have you look at this grid, which is basically fancy graph paper. And we're looking for wiggly distorted lines. So distortion or dark spots in, in that grid can be, can be an indication of macular degeneration. Not always, but that can be an indication that we need to look further. So, so going back to the what would slow down aging, um, again, it becomes common sense, uh, lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, probably not our best choice. Uh, we, want, we want to try to avoid that as best we can. Uh, kale, salads, of course, better than 
um, than uh, uh, in and out hamburgers, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, we, we all kind of know the answers to these. Um, but dark green leafy fruits and vegetables and, fr and fruits, um, over processed foods and meats and fatty foods, lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle, not as good as exercise. Um, it starts to become pretty self explanatory when you really think about how we slow down aging. So, one and the same. So, the one thing that's um, a big risk factor that we can modify is nutrition. Uh, we can we can supplement the retina with with uh, certain vitamin supplements, and um, so we usually recommend a daily multivitamin. The Centrum Silver is a good one. I don't know if they may have changed the the labeling uh, uh, from what you see here, but um, the Centrum Silver, a one a day multivitamin, gets you the hundred percent of your daily allowance, and then something um, like an A Reds two vitamin is is what we call it. Uh, Preservision is the most common one that we recommend. Um, and uh, that's to supplement and add specifically the eye, eye nutrients that will help to protect and slow down macular degeneration. AREDS2, if you're wondering, that's the big study. That was a 10,000, approximately 10,000 patient study run by the National Eye Institute um, that showed that this particular formulation at this particular dose slows down or reduces the chances of it progressing to a more advanced stage of macular degeneration by about 27%. So it is a fair deal here. Um, the reason we recommend Centrum Silver and Preservision, this particular brand, and I have no financial interest in this, I wish I did, um, but uh, these were the two that were most commonly used by most of those, by over half of the people in the study. So we know that those particular brands work. Other acceptable brands, things that you may uh, be familiar with, Occuvite or ICAPS, um, uh, are also acceptable. It doesn't matter to me, uh, in, in my opinion, as long as you're getting those vitamin supplementation, um, you should get the benefit of that risk reduction. So um, dark green leafy vegetables, kale, spinach, romaine lettuce, uh, fresh fish if you can, two to three times a week, uh, also add another one to 2% each. So all in all, we're talking about almost a 30% risk reduction. So that's pretty good. Um, fresh fish, uh, easy to go overboard in some people. We don't recommend doing it more than two to three times a week. And that is to offset the mercury content in some of these fish. So, um, so just um, we, we want to increase the, the fish intake, but not too much, okay? Um, and it is better than the fish oil supplements. I will make a quick comment on that. The fish oil vitamins or the pills, uh, we just haven't been able to refine them and the omega-3s uh, that well to be that beneficial. Nothing beats eating the real thing. So that's why we say eat fresh fish. Um, and, um, and you should get that extra benefit, so, okay. Um, blue blocking lenses or UV protection uh, is something of a, a little bit of a controversial debate. Yes, we know that there is a damaging effect of UV and blue light on retinal cells. If we sit there and hold a, a blue light right up against your eye and hold it there for hours on end, yes, we're gonna cause macular degeneration and a lot of other retinal damage. So we do know that there is some harm in blue light However, it is a little bit difficult. We can't. It's impossible to quantify that. So we can't actually study how much is enough or how much is too much, I should say. But what I can tell you is this. In our, we have very large population studies. I mean, tens of thousands of patients. And when we look at them and look at their macular degeneration and we divide them into those people who have higher blue light or higher outdoors time, versus those who don't spend a lot of time outdoors, um, we see no difference between those two groups. So, um, so be wary of that. Um, I usually say there's no real definitive evidence showing that blue blocking glasses help. Um, I would say that most of the articles out there tend to be uh, dangers of blue light lenses by my product at the very end. So I would say take it with a grain of salt. Um, that's uh, not to say that they're not helpful, but uh, it's more to say that we just don't have the evidence that shows that they're super beneficial at this time. Um, certainly, by all means, if you feel more comfortable, by all means, wear them. Um, every last bit helps. Um, so it's certainly not going to harm you. Um, that's kind of my take on it, but I usually leave that um, up to uh, your own discretion. So, Okay, so those are general treatments for anybody who has macular degeneration, wet or dry, any stage, it doesn't matter.
Now let's talk about wet macular degeneration treatments. These are the ones that we've been hearing about historically for a long, long, long time, uh, since about 2004. Um, these are the injections. These are the shots that we give into the eye. Uh, it sounds awful. It's not as terrible as, as it sounds, so I'm told. Um, but, uh, but yeah, these are the infamous injections into the eye that slow it down. So, um, But um, let's first start off with the evolution of this. In the early stages of treatment, this was primarily in the 80s and 90s, we used a laser to burn the bleeding blood vessels. And you can see that the, the benefit it actually only had a 15, 1-5% success rate. But that was all we had. Um, we would burn the, the retina and we'd burn the central vision and say, you know, we're going to make the vision worse now, but hopefully it won't be as bad as if we didn't do anything at all, which is not a very convincing <laughs> Uh, convincing treatment option. And as you can see, the success, 15% success kind of backs that story up, doesn't really do too much. So um, we were short of a lot of surgeries and people were, we were desperate looking for things. So then we thought, well, what if we do surgery? What if we move a good part of the retina, healthy part of the retina and moved it into the center area? We call that macular translocation surgery. That lasted a few months. And then we realized that we were actually causing more damage and we quickly stopped that. So uh, we don't really do that anymore. Sometimes we'll put a gas bubble in the eye. Some people, uh, if you have a very large hemorrhage, like this picture down here on the bottom right, some people will choose to have a gas bubble and push that bleed out of the center, push it off into the more peripheral parts of the vision so it doesn't, hopefully we can save, um, save the center part of the vision if we catch it early enough. Some people have had a, a miniature telescope that, put, that gets put in. Instead of a cataract surgery, they'll have the cataract or lens taken out and a telescope, a tiny little telescope put in. Um, we're also trying to do that on, for people who haven't or who've already had cataract surgery. And currently Harvard Eye is involved in this clinical trial also. So for people who've had um, cataract surgery and have had uh, or have an advanced stage of macular degeneration, we are trying to create a magnification system inside the eye to help people read. Um, it's not really treatment, it's, it, it's a, a vision aid device. It helps you to see a little bit better, um, but get around, but it doesn't really treat the actual problem. Um, treating the problem is, is um, the injections um, that, that I started talking about earlier. And those are what we call anti-VEGF injections. So anti-blood vessel injections. And those started at back in about 2004, and some of you maybe uh, who are on this may have even um, had, had started with these. And these were revolutionary. We suddenly went from a 16, uh, excuse me, a 15% success rate all the way up to about a 66 to 75% success rate with these medications alone. We were finally, for the first time in history, able to actually improve and restore some of that vision loss. And so since then, what we've been doing is trying to modify that and try to find better, longer lasting, stronger medications um, that will hold up longer. And so you can see every few years, we come out with something new. And these are all the trademark names, um, which uh, each one sort of gets successively stronger and longer acting. Um, and, um, and we just try to find, we just have a lot of different options and we try to find the right medication for, the, uh, for every patient. So. So this is kind of what it does. When we start to see fluid, this is the top line here. If you'll remember this OCT scan, we're looking at it sideways again. You'll see that there's fluid, these black areas of cysts um, that we see. And we give one injection. This particular patient went from, had 27D vision. So that's like the middle of the chart, not great vision. Um, but we gave one Lucentis injection and miraculously we caught it just in time and we're able to shrink it down and it flattened out very nicely. And you can see this almost looks almost like an early stage dry macular degeneration. So we were able to dry that up pretty nicely. So, and of course the vision in this patient improved from 2070 to almost 2020, which is phenomenal. Um, that's of course not, not necessarily typical, but I, I did wanna demonstrate the power of early treatments and the power of these medications. Um, we can restore a heck of a lot of vision when caught in time. So this is going back to our car analogy, the dry macular generation it continues on, but wet, you run out of gas and we start to bleed. And so giving an injection is kind of like filling up the gas tank. You get to go a little bit further on. We fill up the gas tank again, give another injection. 
and you get to continue on those set of tires. So, um, so this has been revolutionary. We've been able to stop a, a very rapidly progressing problem of disease uh, to something that's much more manageable. Um, we now have a surgery uh, that's available for some select patients. It's something we call a port delivery system. Uh, for peop some people who just need a lot of shots, some people need month uh, an injection into the eye every month, and that's a lot, especially if there's transportation problems or sometimes people are not as mobile, they need wheelchair uh, access or assistance and, and um, just other medical conditions may, be, uh, may not be so uh, amenable to getting in the car and schlepping into the doctor's office once a month for these injections for the rest of life. So in some patients, this is an option uh, where we can now implant a small reservoir. It's a little, I, I actually don't know what it's made out of. I believe it's a um, silicone or maybe it's acrylic. It's a little refillable um, device and it holds six months worth of anti-VEGF medication, Lucentis in particular. Um, and it holds that and it slowly releases that into the eye over time. So um, because it is a surgery, uh, so, you, you know, that's, that, that is the, the con part of it. It is a surgery. So, and it is an implant. So implants can get infected and can lead to a lot, of, lot worse situations. So, um, so not everybody's a candidate for it, but just, so, um, just to let everybody know that this is out there. Um, I would say it's the vast minority of people um, um, are actually eligible for this. Most people are not eligible for it, uh, but it's, but you can see how the evolution of our treatments are is is changing um, very rapidly. And we don't like giving injections as much as you don't like receiving them. So it's um it's a huge burden of care for everybody involved. So uh, we we don't want to do them as if we can if we can find a way to do them less often, we certainly want to find that. So here is the long awaited uh, topic that I get asked every single year. And that is an end by every single patient who comes in is, when are we gonna have treatment for dry macular degeneration? And we finally have it. This was a few days ago. This is hot off the press. The FDA finally approved um, two Fridays ago. Uh, FDA finally approved the first ever dry macular degeneration treatment. Now. Um, take that with a grain of salt. Don't get too excited just yet, but it is the first of its kind. And finally, we've got something, and this is exciting. Um, it's a medication we call, uh, the trade name is called Sifovri or Sifovri. I don't really know how to pronounce that. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but um, I don't know, <laughs> know who comes up with these names. But, um, but they finally approved the first ever uh, medication. It's for an advanced stage of dry mac macular degeneration. So for people who already have those bald spots, those areas of atrophy, we can slow down the progression of those of the atrophy by 17 to 22 percent, depending on the dose. Um, some people we gave the injections in the clinical trials every month, and some people got it every two months. So the people who got it every two months had a had a, a lower uh, a 17 percent uh, 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 slower speed. And people who got more medication, of course, had a had a much better uh, uh, better treatment effect, so twenty two percent effect. So um, it doesn't reverse damage, and that's the important thing. It only slows down progression. So not everybody will want this, and not everybody will need this treatment. And we're trying to figure out exactly, or I'm trying to figure out exactly, who the best person is for it, because what we're finding is that. Some people, although um, we're reducing the risk and we're giving injections frequently, the question that you have is, well, why not give it every month if you can tolerate it? Let's slow it down. Well, it's because of side effects. Uh, the more often you dose it might actually increase our risk for wet macular degeneration. And so this is where the treatment uh, conundrum is going to be. Who has the right balance? Um, how often do we give it? Who's the right person to start it in? When do we start it? Um, these are all going to be discussions that you're going to have with your doctor. Um, and, um, and I don't think we're going to have a one size fits all. This is going to be a very much a custom treatment for, uh, for depending on the patient for, for each patient. So uh, for example, this is somebody who has advanced dry AMD and I've outlined the area of atrophy in the center here. And over time, we can see how the atrophy slowly grows. 
But in reality, this patient has already lost the center vision. So we may not choose to treat this patient. May not be a great, great person to have shots because they really aren't gonna change over time and, and they've already lost the functionality. And let's compare that to other people. So some, this person here um, has that C shape again, has pretty good vision in the middle. And we can see how it slowly starts to close off over time. Well, maybe they wanna have that treatment. We can slow down that, this donut ring here um, by giving treatments. Likewise, this patient in the bottom here, this bottom starts off with two small areas. Maybe if they start getting the treatments um, with this medication, we can pr prevent it or slow it down from getting to complete central vision loss in this bottom right corner. So, um, so trying to figure out exactly when to start it is going to be a challenge. Um, and trying to figure out if you're eligible or not is going to depend on the doctor uh, that you're seeing. And hopefully you guys will all ask what stage you're at and if you're eligible for any of these treatments. I think it, um, you may wanna be a little bit proactive in the first, in, in the next few months because not everybody will be aware of, of this new advent um, and not everybody will have it accessible. It's not, a, it's not available yet. So this will be probably the ramping up uh, mark, uh, production right now. So I would anticipate we start seeing uh, this become commercially available in probably by next quarter. So maybe in about three months. So is my guess. So, um, but um, so um, I've already started having discussions with my patients um, uh, about it already. So uh, for those who are candidates and those who are not. So, but yeah, if we can prevent central vision loss, um, then that's probably that um, that's the way to go. And we're just looking for a few more years. Now, for those people who've already lost their central vision, um, and um, we wanna try and figure out how to cope with that. And this is a, another treatment area. Uh, how do we live with advanced stage or end stage macular generation? Because it, yes, it's associated with depression and diabetes and hearing impairment and, and stroke and falls. And it's hard to, and you can imagine how you just become isolated if you let the disease consume you. Um, not to mention, it's a huge financial burden on the taxpayer because uh, it's, uh, it's a huge, it requires a second person or even a third person to help take care of that patient, depending on um, how, how, uh, how capable and how independent that person is. Um, if somebody has severe macular degeneration and they're 65, they can probably do quite a few things. I do have patients like that who are still able to pass the DMV driving test with advanced stage macular degeneration because they're able to utilize their peripheral vision well. In somebody who has advanced dementia, that may not be the case. That's gonna be a much harder recovery and, and you can see why the, that people uh, at, um, in that scenario would probably need somebody's help, a caretaker's help full time. So, okay. So in general, we try to say we make low vision recommendations. Uh, increase the lights, brighter lights, magnifying glasses, uh, tablets or e-readers are great because you can actually just use it by pinching the screen. You can actually zoom in and really see things with a backlit screen. So actually those have been very helpful for those who are more technologically inclined. Um, and vision aid devices, I've put a couple here on the side, a uh, handheld digital magnifier. Um, this TV-like thing is something we call a closed circuit TV. It projects a, anything that you place under it onto a big screen so you can read it. Uh, and then these fancy glasses here are, are what we call bioptic telescopes. Um, those are very special, very expensive, but uh, some people do very well at, with those. Um, so we do recommend when you start to get to this end stage, we, see, we can recommend consultation with a low vision optometrist, uh, somebody who can optimize and maximize your vision. Uh, we recommend usually an, seeing an occupational therapist, somebody who can help you with the day-to-day -day skills, how to how to count your money if you can't read the denomination anymore, for example, uh, requires uh, can um, involve folding the bills in certain ways so, such that you can know just by feeling it uh, what that denomination is. And then, of course, we want to optimize your peripheral vision. So um, I'm going to brag a little bit I'm, for just a moment. Uh, I'm going to do a, a shameless plug. I, I did receive in the past few months uh, my sixth patent. Uh, as Michael mentioned, I was an engineer, mechanical engineer prior to becoming a physician. So um, I have spent the, uh, some t quite a bit of time for the past several years with the team at a company called Idaptic, and we've been developing a device, uh, several devices actually, for people who have an advanced stage 
uh, macular degeneration, and it is something that is a wearable device. This is our actually our first model. The, the newer ones look much, much sexier than this one. This one looks kind of blockish. And, uh, but, uh, but what it is, is it's something we call augmented reality. And what we're trying, what we're able to do is put, um, if I go back a few slides, we were able to put all of these devices, telescope, a closed circuit TV, and a magnifying glass all into one device. Uh, so you don't have to lug around three different things when you're doing, uh, when you're going out shopping or grocery shopping, for example. So um, we tried to put this in uh, to an augmented reality form. Augmented reality means that we put a screen in the center of your vision um, and because that's where the problem is, but we don't block out the rest of your vision. So some of you may have heard of virtual reality. Virtual reality, we close off all of your vision into this box, which I, uh, we, we didn't, I didn't think that was necessary to do that because your people with macular generation, peripheral vision is fine. It's the center vision that we need to fix and augment and alter. So that's what these screens are in the center of each lens is a digital screen. So these computerized glasses will help you see up close, uh, read things that you need to see, see up close. Oh, sorry, that's a video. Um, let me let that run. Sorry. Um, So it'll have an automatic zoom, sorry for the audio there, but, um, but it has text recognition. So you don't have to identify text. It will automatically zoom in for you. So we try to make this as, um, as autonomous as possible. Uh, likewise, it's a telescope. So you can see this patient was using them and can read the signs at a distance uh, and can order food at the deli here. So sorry for the video, um, but, um, and so we've got much newer designs here, and these are the currently available ones. We've got several different models available. We do have those available for consultation. If you'd like to be evaluated for that, we can just give us a call and set up an appointment asking about the eidaptic devices or the, the low vision devices that we have here. Um, it tends to really improve vision. We can improve vision by 10 lines of vision, reading vision in a lot of people and about 80% of people. It doesn't work for everybody, but 80% of people are able to read six lines of vision or more uh, with this, which is really just phenomenal. Um, but I would say that not, a, not all of those 80% of people, it, does, it doesn't work for everybody. You have to kind of get used to computerized or digital glasses, but it is something definitely worth trying out um, if you can, because it certainly makes your life a lot better. Um, uh, we've got a lot of successful patients on it already, so and have been using it for um, about six years now, five years now, so um, so good. Um, now this gets me to the final topic, uh, and that is the future of macular degeneration. So where is research going? And um, for dry macular degeneration, it's tough uh, because it's a little bit like a monkey on a typewriter. Um, we don't have any great animal models, meaning that we don't have any way to experiment uh, Treatments, new treatments, drug treatments cannot be tested on animals like mice or rats. Um, right, mice or rats don't get macular degenerate, don't get dry macular degeneration. So, um, so the only species on the planet that we can really test on are humans. So you can imagine the red tape and the ethics behind that. Um, and not to mention that these are studies that are that last years before we see any measurable change. So um, years and time frame directly equates to cost. Uh, we're talking hundreds of millions, and um, uh, you can quickly see how uh, the return on the investment is is very challenging here. So um, the problem with the other problem with dry macular generation is we don't know what causes it. We don't know why it happens. Yes, we know it's related to the altered immune system. We know it's related to slowing metabolism. We know it's genetically related, but we we don't really know that definitive connection and if we don't know why it's happening we don't really know what to fix and that's the monkey on the typewriter it's it, we're just kind of throwing darts uh, blindly and and um, if you uh, hopefully one day uh, if we start punching away at the at the keyboard enough times with a, enough randomness we'll hopefully eventually get a nice poem um, <laughs> uh, over time so 
hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll start to get a winter medication, we'll start to see that um, emerge hopefully pretty soon. So um, we've tried some uh, treatments modifying retinal metabolism. We are certainly undergoing clinical trials currently with oral and uh, subcutaneous, uh, so injections underneath the skin. Um, so systemic medications are trying to alter retinal metabolism. We're trying to block the immune cascade. Uh, so we're, we're already seeing that new medication, Cyfovri. Uh, we are expecting a second medication to be FDA approved over the next, uh, the next within the next year, I believe. Um, so uh, that will follow closely behind it. Um, those block the immune cascade. Um, again, it slows down macular degeneration, does not reverse it. So we're still looking to reverse it if we can. Um, hopefully, we'll see that with stem cells uh, or stem cell-derived RPE cells is the technical term for it. So hopefully, we'll see that. The clinical trials so far in the infancy uh, stages currently, we're not seeing a huge benefit yet. Um, it is, they are a lot, most of them are surgeries. Um, and uh, I think the hardest part with any sort of stem cell is that we want them to grow and replace the dead cells, but we also want them to stop growing so that they don't grow into a tumor. Um, and that's a problem too. So how do we do that? That's a great question. And we're trying to figure that out right now. So um, I would say we're still a ways off from stem cells for this condition. Um, and clinical trials tend to be more harmful than they are beneficial. So it's, uh, we're still trying to figure out how to do that. Um, but there are clinical trials uh, for those people who are more, um, more inclined uh, to do that. Um, there are far and few. Uh, well, you would have to probably call around or look on, on the, uh, the National Institute of Health um, website and see if there are any current clinical trials on that. I don't think there are any actively enrolling, to my knowledge, locally, certainly not in California. So, um, so not to my knowledge. But um, Prophylactic injections to prevent that. We just had a, a first study. Doesn't seem to work very well. Um, laser, maybe. So we'll we'll see. But um, but we're constantly working on it to see if we can get something for dry macular degeneration. It is one of those heavily researched areas. So like wet macular degeneration. Now wet macular degeneration is the hev most heavily researched area uh, in all of the retinal conditions, um, and we're just ever we're constantly modifying it and um, evolving it now wet macular generation fortunately does have an animal model so we can test on animals and that's why we do see all these drug drugs coming to market very quickly like every few years we, we're getting newer ones stronger ones long ones that long, uh, last longer uh, and um, and also cheaper ones less expensive so we can give these in, uh, medications to more of the population so we are now starting to look at combination treatment. Uh, so instead of giving an anti-VEGF, we're looking at blocking other molecules also. Um, the analogy I make is it's kind of like cancer treatment. Back in the 60s and 70s, we used to give one medication and that didn't last very long. Um, it wasn't very effective. Um, but once we started adding multiple drugs, then we started to see really great um, uh, lifespans and we were able to kill cancer pretty effectively with combination treatment. So that's where that's kind of what we're looking for with macular degeneration too is how do we attack this these blood vessels from multiple uh, multiple um, areas. Um, stem cells, yep, uh, like we talked about, same for wet macular degeneration. We're trying to do the same thing, those stem cells, but again pretty far away from that. Um, and then high-tech implants as well. So um, digital uh, digital retinas, for example, but we're, we're really far from that also. So, uh, take home points. So as in conclusion, we'll, uh, I'll leave you with just a few of the, of the main points here. Again, macular degeneration is not a totally blinding condition. Yes, it can be impairing. Yes, it can be legal blindness uh, and affect the central vision only, uh, but it is not totally blinding. See your eye doctor regularly. Remember, everybody age 50 or over should be seeing their eye doctor, um, optometrist, or ophthalmologist annually. And please have them make sure that they're looking inside of the eye with either a photograph or a dilated eye exam, preferably dilation if possible. Uh, think of a Mac AMD or macular generation as aging of the eyes. And um, if you think of it in terms of aging, you automatically know exactly how to treat it. So, uh, so just a healthy lifestyle.
AREDS 2 vitamins only help those who have macular degeneration. So the vitamins only, uh, the supplementation, sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. The AREDS 2 vitamins, yes, help slow down macular degeneration or reduce the chances of it, get, of, of it progressing, but it only benefits those people who have an intermediate or a moderate stage of macular degeneration. It does not help people who don't have macular degeneration, does not prevent you from getting it. So uh, save your money, don't take them. Um, and uh, yeah, beware of all the, the, uh, the articles out there. We have just seen zero benefit of anybody uh, earlier um, than having macular degeneration. It just doesn't benefit those who don't have it. So, um, so save those for later. Early treatment of wet macular degeneration means vision. Uh, if you start seeing distortion or spots in the vision, get in within a few days. Within a, uh, I usually say within a week, we can usually do. We can usually accommodate you, uh, and we want to jump in and, and jump on that uh, and shut down those leaky blood vessels as soon as possible. Um, uh, so, so just be proactive about it if you start seeing changes. Um, and then my last bullet point is the new one. Just because we have a new dry macular degeneration treatment. Make sure you ask your eye care provider um, if you are a candidate for dry macular degeneration treatment. Um, this is going to take some time to uh, to become uh, common knowledge within the community. All of all of the doctors here at Harvard Eye uh, are now up to date. They they all know um, who is a candidate and who is not. So you can ask any one of us um, if they need to see um, either myself or my partner, Dr. Sonia Dute, uh, the two retina specialists here. Uh, so you can ask anybody what your stage is, if you're a candidate for it, um, but, uh, but as general recommendations, now we want to know the stage. We want to know the stage of macular degeneration. So, okay. Uh, so be proactive out there, guys, um, and uh, yeah, and really take control of it. It's, it seems we're, we're getting better every year. It seems to get much, much better and much more optimistic, and, and soon I hope one day we'll be, be able to have this totally beat and um, we'll be able to save vision. Uh, for the years to come. So thank you so much. Uh, and I guess I'll give us a call. Yeah, if you have any questions or uh, like a consultation for macular degeneration, or if you'd like a consultation for the idaptic uh, device, the low vision device, just give us a call. Uh, we're happy to, to accommodate you. So all right. For anything any like, and if you're anything like me and you come up with questions in the days following a presentation and taking in all that information, you can always feel free to email us at the same uh, email that you registered with the marketing at Harvard Eye will be happy um, to go ahead and reach out to you and get you in contact um, and kind of get you the answers we need. Um, but speaking of questions, we do have a couple of great ones, Dr. Kim, if you don't mind me firing away. Sure, yeah. Um, the first of which is um, uh, if someone were to have a, had to have had a retinal tear that was lasered away, would that impact um, your eye down the road in like progressing or possibly um, leading you to acquire AMD? No, they, um, that's a great question. Um, the retinal conditions are pretty diverse and there are, there's a myriad of, uh, of different problems we can get. Um, retinal tears, and I think you'll, you'll quickly see, is um, retinal tears and retinal detachments usually, or almost always, I should say, occur in the peripheral retina. So it wouldn't really make sense that it would affect the center part of the retina. Um, retinal detachments, uh, however, so if, uh, if you have a more serious condition, uh, retinal detachments can affect the macula, but do not cause macular degeneration. So that's a great question, uh, but no, that's an entirely separate, uh, separate uh, d disease problem. Uh, should not have any effect on, on macular degeneration. Um, do you know if there have been any studies measuring AMD progression being slowed down um, with the chelation treatments to improve cellular level in the eye as well as the body? Um, like uh, blood chelation treatments. Um, yeah, I think uh, some people have tried to do that. Again, they were trying to uh, apply uh, things like ozone treatments and trying to, I've heard of that, uh, chelation treatments, uh, trying to work with more of a holistic approach. Um, I would say that we don't have great evidence on it uh, to, to back that at this point in time. Uh, that's not to say that it doesn't work. I, that's just more to say that we don't know if it works. Um, so I would say buyer beware. 
Um, again, if you remember why most of people have macular degeneration, it's genetic. Uh, so therein lies the problem. Um, we can control a little bit, but um, it's a lot of it is is not necessarily uh, something that we may want to go to dr drastic measures. Like chelation is a is a pretty major thing. Um, it's a it's a pretty significant um, process to to change out uh, and and supplement the blood or or change out the blood um, products. And so um, wouldn't wouldn't rec really recommend it at this point in time. It's an interesting thought. Um, but, uh, but currently there is no medical rationale, uh, for, for justifying that, um, at this time. So, um, and then uh, somebody's just wondering, uh, kind of a little bit more about the drusen. Is that what causes the bleeding in wet AMD or is there a different cause that leads to the bleeding? Uh, great cause. Yeah. Very great, great question. Um, yeah, drusen we know is related, um, and we don't really know why people suddenly go from dry macular degeneration, drusen to dry macular degeneration to bleeding. We just, we just don't. Um, but, um, but going back to the trash bag analogy, so you have one or two trash bags, one or two drusen in the eye, eh, probably fine and, and no problem. Um, but if you start to have too much, it starts to damage the retinal cells. And that's when we start to have dry macular degeneration. When we start to have damage to the cells, the body we think tries to repair it. And we think it tries to repair it by sometimes causing bleeding and scar formation. We try to repair it. Um, so we think that's what's causing it. So drusen in and of its of themselves actually don't directly cause wet macular degeneration and bleeding, but they certainly are a contributing factor. We just don't, we don't really understand why. Um, a lot of people will ask this question and the follow-up question is really, well, what if we take care of the drusen? If we were able to get rid of the drusen, would we not have macular generation? <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's a great question, um, but because um, that's only part of the problem. The, the, uh, the part of the problem is drusen are indicators of a slowing metabolism. So if we get rid of the trash bags, well, we still have the problem of the metabolism. We still have the problem of the genetics. We still have problem with that immune system. So, um, so it, it's solving a symptom. It's not really solving the problem uh, in and of itself we think. Um, we haven't been able to successfully get rid of drusen. We've tried. We've, uh, some people are, uh, so there's a couple guys, a couple people um, across the globe, on the other side of the globe, who think they think they found a laser that might get drusen to go away. Um, but we have not seen that impact the, um, the diagnosis of macular degeneration. So if we get drusen to go away, you, you might still end up with macular degeneration. So um, so the question is, why do we do that? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, that's uh, we, we don't. It's sort of an answer without really an answer. <laughs> yeah. um, so I apologize for that. But uh, so, but great question. Um, are there any uh, medications that would be cause for concern for patients with AMD, um, specifically things like anastrol, uh, anastrozole, or albuterol? Um, any steroid inhalers, things of that nature. Uh, great question. Um, yeah, medications um, are always a concern for a lot of conditions. Uh, macular degeneration is no different. Um, and astrazole, uh, not typically. Uh, steroids, no, not typically. In fact, steroids, we actually were, were an early treatment for some macular degeneration patients back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so no, um, albuterol, no. Uh, but um, there is one in particular that is of, of recent uh, concern that's uh, that was used for um, a bladder condition, um, and um, it's called pentosen polysulfate, um, or PPS is how we uh, how we abbreviate it. Um, and um, and I'm blanking on the uh, the trade name right now, but pentosen is something for um, interstitial cystitis is the name of the bladder condition. Not a great treatment, but it was the only it's the only thing that we had uh, that they had for for the treatment of that. Um, that might actually cause macular degeneration in some people after you take it for 10 years or more. So, uh, so that's the only medication that we know of at the time, um, at this time, that has any impact on macular degeneration at all. So, um, yeah, and would a macular pucker increase the risk of AMD? Uh, no, that's a good question. It's, it does involve the macula also, but no, it should not have any impact.
impact at all. Kind of in a similar vein, would myopic macular degeneration function, is that functionally the same as dry AMD? Functionally, it is the same. Yes, any sort of macular, there are lots of different types of macular degeneration. Tonight's uh, talk is mostly about age-related macular degeneration. But yes, you can get myopic macular degeneration from myopia or near, uh, severe nearsightedness. Uh, you can also have macular degeneration like a juvenile. Uh, there's a children's onset form of macular degeneration. There are other genetic, uh, what we call macular dystrophies. Uh, so a lot of things can cause macular degeneration. Um, and functionally, they all end up in the same. Uh, it's a central vision loss uh, in time. So myopic degeneration is a, sort of a totally different beast. Um, it's not, um, I personally sometimes will recommend vitamins to try and at least counteract some of the aging components, um, but we don't have any great evidence. We don't really have any great fix for it because it's mostly something you're born with. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a trickier scenario, but, um, but yes, functionally very similar to macular degeneration for some people, yes. Lots of great questions, everyone, and it does look like that is uh, the, the, the end of the question session for today. Um, and if you are curious, we absolutely will be sending out a link of this entire presentation um, that you will be able to watch and review. Um, it will also, that link will take you to our YouTube page, which there's also a lot of wonderful videos, so you can, you can go down the rabbit hole. There's a lot of great content on there um, that can kind of address your, your eye concerns and eye questions that you may have. Um, so we will absolutely be sending out a link to that after tonight's presentation. Um, and I guess before we take off for the evening, Dr. Kim, any last words? No, thank you, everybody. Um, we, we've really had very successful turnout for this, <laughs> for this conference series for 10 years. And um, just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I've always been a firm believer that educating patients is the number one most important thing. Um, if you know what you've got and you know why you've got it and you know what you can do about it, um, you're going to be a better doctor than any doctor ever will. So uh, thank you all for being proactive and, and really taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to listen tonight. Um, it's ever changing. Uh, so this is, um, this is one of my favorite talks to give every year. Uh, we give it every February. So stay tuned. Uh, I'm sure there'll be new things to talk about next year too. So. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining and spending your evening. And like you said, Dr. Kim, hopefully this time next year, there's a, a couple more things that have surfaced and that will help out um, with, with the treatment of, of AMD. So we, we do very much so appreciate everybody joining us this evening and spending their, their Tuesday, uh, Tuesday evening with us. We hope you have a great rest of your day uh, and have a wonderful night, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everybody.